Well, greetings, friends. Certainly a joy and a privilege to be able to come back to you again this month and just enter into your home and to fellowship with you by means of a tape. It has uh, always been a blessing for me uh, to share with you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the way he has dealt with me in my own heart. And during this time, I am, of course, dealing with you uh, or preaching to you on the messages on faith. Back some months ago, I was in, I was impressed that I should do redo the very basic faith tapes for people. Now, many of you may already have the old faith tapes, but you may find some new light in these old faith tapes. And, of course, the light uh, is few and far between coming. You know, it's, it's not, it doesn't come every day. So I, even if you have these old tapes, I would encourage you to listen to these new tapes because I'm giving you the latest material that the Lord has given me. And uh, I am finding a real blessing in presenting these tapes. Now, there may not be but one or two more because I will have covered all the basic material on the faith tapes, and then again, there may be more. Now, it uh, will be according to how the Lord, you know, really leads me. Well, I pray that you'll pray for us. Uh, during uh, this coming year, I'm going to be making a trip to Switzerland. We're going to have about 300 people over there. This will be a Bible conference that I believe God will develop and develop and develop into a mighty conference for, uh, for the saved. And I, I'm trusting that God will do a great and mighty work uh, while we're in Switzerland. And when, uh, while we're there, you will receive this tape. So please pray for us. Also, I will be going on a couple of other foreign trips this year, which is a new thing for me. It will challenge me to have to trust the Lord for my health in a different way. It will uh, challenge me to have to trust the Lord for finances in a different way. So I do need your prayers. I really want you to lift me up because the Lord is blessing. And uh, I'm uh, just wondering if the Lord is wanting me to get into an international type ministry. So I, I really need your prayers. I really count on you folk that listen to me preach through the tape club. And so I really count on your prayers. So do pray. Now I trust that the Lord will give you a good year. Already this year the Lord has blessed. I was in one meeting where I believe God really touched down and gave an element of revival. And I am looking forward to a continuing ministry in that particular church. So we pray the Lord is doing a great and mighty thing in my own uh, person, in my body, uh, for me. He's working for me physically, and I, I praise him for that. And he's doing some other things that I covered your prayers over, so do pray. And I pray that this meeting, this message on um, faith will really be a blessing to you. What is truth? Learning how to believe the truth and not believing a lie. That is the message of this month. So I pray that it will be your blessing as you listen to it, that God will not only inform you, but change you, charge you, that the world may be different because of you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the third chapter of the book of John and we're going to talk to you tonight about what is truth now I realize that uh, it may be that this message will not mean as much to you if you have not been with me on the preceding messages as it will to those who've been with me. But um, I believe there's much light to be discovered from this message tonight. I believe it's the message for this time, and you pray that the Lord will speak to each of our hearts. There was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, he came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, You must be born again. Now, that's enough scripture to introduce to you what I want to introduce to you. Uh, Nicodemus was a preacher, and of course, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And obviously, Nicodemus had heard about Jesus, and he wanted to meet him. And we feel, I feel in my own heart, that uh, Nicodemus ended up getting saved. And uh, I uh, wouldn't ha- want to have to prove it tonight, but I do believe he, he met the Lord. There's some indication of that. But Nicodemus had a question. When Jesus said to him, you must be born again if you're going to get into the kingdom of God, uh, Nicodemus couldn't understand that. He was trying to comprehend it with his mind. And he just couldn't understand how can a man be born again. And Jesus uh, here introduces to Nicodemus two worlds, the spirit world and the material world. That's what I want you to see uh, for just a moment. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. There are two worlds. There is the material world and there is the spirit world. Now, when we uh, start dealing with this issue of the two worlds, uh, we just want to see that that we are creatures of two worlds if we have been born of the Spirit. If we've been born of the Spirit. We're creatures of two worlds. One of the great things that happens to a person when they get saved by the grace of God, they take on the capacity to live not only in this material world, but the spirit world at the same time. They take on that capacity. Now, in the spirit world, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We have angels, we have seraphims, we have cherubims, all in the spirit world. And, of course, you have Lucifer, the devil, in the spirit world. You have the fallen angels. You have demons and so on in the spirit world. And in the material world, uh, you can see, smell, taste, feel, and hear what you have, can't you? It's not difficult for you to know that you're real, uh, is it? I mean, uh, you just hang around a while and this old body will get to feeling so bad, you'll know it's real. But you know that there is a material world in which you live. And you relate to this material world by what how you see, smell, taste, feel, and hear. Now, it's an amazing thing uh, to, to me to understand uh, the truth that I'm wanting to share with you tonight and just sort of bring you into some of the reality of God. Uh, it's so difficult to do that for people. It's uh, worse than herd, herding a bunch of cows. And I, I'm not insulting you, believe me. But uh, a revival meetings is, to me, a lot of times like herding people into doing something they're afraid to do and uh, into doing something they don't want to do. And yet, once they do it, then, of course, they are excited. You know, that they have really blessed God by trusting Him. Well, tonight, I trust that I can herd you in Uh, to trusting Jesus because I just do not believe you're trusting Jesus. I I believe uh, you're playing at the game. I think you are gloating over your success till you have about let success slip from you. We rejoice over the blessings of yesterday so much today 
that we forget that today is the day we're supposed to be trusting the Lord and we let the glory of God slip from us. So I'm trusting that tonight that God will move on your heart and uh, really quicken your spirit. And I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself that the Lord will really let me uh, see myself to move out with God that I might honor Him and glorify Him. Now, I have a, in my hand here a Bible. Now, this is a strange book, a very unique book. So much could be said of this book, and I love this book, and it means so much to me. Now, this book is very unusual in many ways, but in one way I want to just share tonight. <clears throat> We have uh, the two worlds, the spirit world and the material world, and I'd like to uh, refer to the material world as the sense world. Is that, are you still with me? The sense world, meaning the fact that you have the senses, you can see, smell, taste, feel, and hear, and, uh, and you relate to this world through your senses. And so we have the sense world, uh, meaning the material world. Now. In the fact that we have this uh, sense world about us and uh, we are made up of it and we have the spirit world, we have this Bible that's, uh, that has a message from the spirit world but it's in the language of the sense world. You can read it and comprehend what you read, but you cannot comprehend its message unless the Holy Spirit interprets that message to you. You say, where did you get that from? The book of 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, beginning at the 10th verse through the rest of the chapter. I read it here this week. The Lord has to make the Word of God known to you, regardless of your intellectual capacities. If the Holy Spirit doesn't take the Word of God and make it real to you, you still are deaf and dumb to God. Amen. Regardless of your intellectual capacities. You know, you may comprehend intellectually, but beloved, it's through the Holy Spirit that God gives light and life. So, um, this is a strange book. It's got a spirit world message with a sense world language. And you know, you read it and can comprehend it, but only can the Holy Spirit make it alive to you. Now, in relationship to um, how you and I walk as sense world people <clears throat> that have been born of the Spirit that's entered into living a two-dimensional life, some would say, some would say a three-dimensional life, um, the Word of God comes to us on Two different levels. The Word of God comes through us, uh, to us on the basis of precious promises. And the Word of God comes to us on the basis of facts. Now I'm talking about in relationship to our Christian living. Now if you haven't learned how to find the precious promises that relate to you as a child of God, and you haven't learned how to discover the facts of God that relate to you and incorporate those promises and facts in your life by faith, you are religious but not Christian. Do you want me to repeat that? And I want you to know something tonight. Ninety. Five percent of the Christians I talk to are religious, not Christians. I, Ninety-five, and I'll guarantee you that is a conservative estimate. Most of the people I talk to are strictly religious, not Christian. And the reason is they have never learned how to discover the promises of God, the facts of God, and incorporate them 
by faith into their life. That's why I spend all of my time preaching on trusting Jesus. Because that's the only way you can incorporate the promises and the facts of God and make them real in your life. No other way. There's no other way to do it. <clears throat> there's just no other way. Now, the Lord lets these word, the word come to us on the basis of a promise. Do you understand what a promise is? And uh, I'm not wanting you to answer. I just want to get your attention, keep your attention. Do you don't understand what a promise from God is? God gives you a special word when you have a special situation. That special word reveals the will of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God, the power of God. That promise reveals what God's up to. That promise is for you for a given situation. Now, what's the fact of God? The fact of God is the truth of God about any given situation that relates to any person. According, it's the fact of God, it's the will of God about any given situation. Now, the promises of God are only applicable to you as God gives them to you or me personally. My promise for a particular situation cannot be your promise unless God gives it to you. But the facts of God differ. The facts of God differ so much. The facts of God are as applicable to you as they are to me. And this is very important for us to understand this because uh, there are many facts in the Bible that we need to discover and incorporate in our lives by faith. And these facts are as applicable to you as they are to me. Applicable to me as they are to you. But on the other hand, the promises of God, God personalizes those to you and me and we have those promises, and we get them. When we get them, we have them. Then we ourselves are responsible for them, and those promises are not applicable to any other person until the Spirit of God gives them that promise. For instance, uh, back in 1970, in January of 71, while I was facing death, the, uh, the Lord gave me a promise. Psalms 128.6 that I would see my children's children. Now that was a promise. Now I have preached to thousands of people all over this country and as far as I know I've never run into any person that's been given that same identical promise for the same reason. That was a promise to me. Now the Lord may raise up that promise for someone else but he'll have to give them to it. They just can't claim it because Brother Manley claimed it. Do you understand what I'm saying about the promise? But now the fact of God, or the facts of God are different. I mean entirely different. And it just blows your mind when you see the difference about the facts of God. Now the facts of God are applicable to every single solitary one of us. I mean it's just as real to you as it is to me. Now what I want to do tonight is I want to look to you with you at some truth. Now, what I have said up to this point, if I need to interpret what I've said, and I trust I don't, is this. You and I need to realize that God's will about a given situation is the truth about a matter. It's the truth about a given matter. And God's children need to learn how to discover the truth about any given matter. And they basically will discover the truth of God about any given matter through the promises of God and through the facts of God. And we need to learn how to discover the truth. Because it's the truth that sets us free. 
Now, if our lives, if we are so, I guess the word would be immature, but if we are so passive, another word for immaturity, maybe passive, if we are so passive or immature that we are willing to let the world and circumstances in our lives pass and not discover the truth of God about given situations, then we'll have to face the consequences of the judgment of God, not only here, but at the judgment seat of Christ. But it'd be, it'd be a blessing if the child of God was mature enough, and intelli- not intelligent enough, but informed enough is what I'm going to say. Because I feel like sometimes the more intelligent people are the people that miss a lot. Amen. So I mean the more informed person. And we need to be informed enough that we do not miss what God has planned for every single solitary one of our lives. Now in, in Ephesians 2.10, a verse that I dealt with Sunday morning, it's obvious from that verse that, um, that God has every person in this world's life planned for them. And that verse plainly indicates, especially in translations like the Amplified Bible, that God has our lives just laid out before us. And we are to discover what God's plan is for our life. And not only that, we are to walk in the plan that God has for us. And my dear friends, it I, I have a very difficult time uh, dealing with people. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really battling it right now in my own person, not necessarily here tonight. Uh, but, uh, but I'm having it very difficult in just life in general. You know why? Because uh, it's so hard for me to accept the fact that a man is so blinded and so bound and so backward spiritually that he would have one reservation held in his life that keeps him from naming Jesus Lord of all. That's hard for me to conceive that a businessman would be that foolish. Amen. It's, it's hard for me to see that a mother would be that foolish. Amen. I mean, and I, I guess this is a confession. And I'll tell you, preacher, it is really tough for me to see a preacher to be that, not foolish, that stupid. No reflection on you, brother. Uh, but I, I run into some. You know, I mean, they try to hold on to two worlds. And I just can't even stand it. I understand that. I have a hard time understanding that. I, I mean... Uh, I go out to lunch with these people and they want to talk, talk about things that's totally unrelated to God. And I just, that, that doesn't make sense to me. And uh, I, I have a hard time doing it. So I usually have to take somebody along that's, that's uh, carnal enough to talk to them. You know, I can't handle that. And I feel like I'm carnal, but I just can't talk, you know, anybody but it's about the things of God. Well... <clears throat> The Lord wants us to be up on it enough as Christians so dedicated to God that the one objective in our life is the will of God. And he says here that God has our life already planned. It's been prearranged for us and we need to discover what God's up to and join him. I mean, boy, it's so beautiful. And if you don't believe that's the case, you read tonight when you get home Psalms 139, the whole chapter. And you know what? Before you were even substance, God wrote down in a book His plan for your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I mean, praise God. 
And I mean it's the good life. It's the successful life. It's the abundant life. It's the wonderful life. It's the marvelous life. It's the life that will lead your children to success. It's the life that will lead your wife, lead your wife, your husband, your friends, your neighbors to success. It's the life that counts. God already has it planned for you. Now to me, it's very hard for me to understand people that are so blind into the things of God that they wouldn't want to discover that and get in on it. I just have a hard time handling that. Amen? Well, what God has to say now, <laughs> now hold on to this, has already been said. Amen. Now that's not deep, that's just simple. Amen. What God has to do in relationship to you, he's already done it. There's nothing deep about that. That's just simple. Because God worked six days and sat down. He completed it all. And you and I, when we come face to face with life and its issues, we need to be spiritual enough and I made this statement this morning and I'll make it to you tonight. Spirituality is the ability to know God and cooperate with Him. That's what a spiritual man is. It's not how many times you come to church. It's not how much money you give. It's not how many times you read your Bible. It's your ability to know God and cooperate with Him. And I assure you, if you know God and cooperate with him, you'll be in church. You'll be giving, you'll be reading your Bible and all that. I know a man, I know many men that read their Bibles mean as the devil. Amen. I mean, I could give you all kinds of illustrations about people that are very religious but mean as the devil. But a child of God has got to get far enough along that they can call, they can know what God's up to and cooperate with him. And what I'm wanting to get across to you is what is true. And truth is what God has said, what God has already done about a given situation. And the promises of God reveal that truth. The facts of God reveal that truth. I think I can illustrate what I've said. Very easily. I think some of you need to turn to this because uh, it'll help you. Because you're going to be shocked at what I'm going to say. Second Peter one three. Second Peter one three. Now here is a fact. Now this is not a promise in that sense that I've dealt with the promise tonight. It is a promise fact, but it is a fact. Second Peter 1, 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us some things. How many? Oh, that's interesting. God, you just must not know what you're talking about. You must have made a mistake, God. You know, you think he did? I challenge some of you, go get you another translation. I wish you would. Amen. It might help you. It give it, he has given unto us all things. Do you suppose God wasn't lying there? Do you suppose God meant what he said when he said he'd given us? Half given, that means half means he's already done it. All things. Oh, brother, man, that's just spiritual matter. Nothing wrong with that except that's not a, that's not a God. Hath given us all things that pertaineth unto life, that's material, and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Did you know what God said about what he's done for us? He hath given unto us all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness. He hath given unto us all things. 
Now, friends, he's already given it. You know what? That's a fact. And you know what you're going to do with this fact? You do it every day. You either accept it or reject it. You either believe it's the truth or you believe it's a lie. When you reject something that you know you believe, did you know that? You know what you do, you just believe a lie. When you reject something, or when I reject something, I don't want to leave myself out of this message. When we reject something, we, we just believe a lie. In other words, unbelief is still man making a choice and they, that they believe a lie. Now, what's the truth about God having given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness? He said, well, Brother Manley, if God has already given it, then I, could see, I should see it, smell it, taste it, feel it, and hear it. No, the, re the real fact in life is not what you can see, smell, taste, feel, and hear. The real fact in life is what God has said. And you and I need to discover the truth. And when we discover the truth and believe the truth, then, beloved, you know what we do? We see the fact, the truth, converted into living material reality in our life. That's why faith is so important. So important to learn to trust Jesus. You see, when you know the fact, then you can believe. You take it by faith. You claim it by faith. You say, Brother Man, I can't handle that. Well, how in the name of heaven do you get saved then? Well, I just walked down the aisle and tried my best. Well, that's not of the Bible. Amen. Well, Brother Manley, I just went down the, by, down the aisle and prayed a prayer. That's not Bible either. Amen. What is? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may have uh, gone down the aisle. You may have prayed a prayer, but I've got news for you. The Bible doesn't say a prayer saves you. Doesn't it? It says that Jesus saves you. Faith doesn't even save you. Faith just enables Jesus to save you. Right? How'd you get saved? As far as I can tell, the biblical way to get saved is for any man and woman to discover the truth. That they are a sinner and that Jesus saves and Jesus has already paid it all. And man must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, accept the fact. What's the fact? That Jesus has died and paid the price. Must accept that fact. And when they accept that fact, by faith, what happens? What's, ha what's true? And what is truth with God becomes truth within our person. Just simply in our person. Now, what's the fact about substance? There's not a one of you in this building tonight that can stand up and tell me you have a need that I couldn't stand up and say, well, God's already met it. You say, well, I can tell you, if, then if he's met it, I'd like to see it. Well, when you can believe he's met it, then you can see it. Well, I can believe he's met it, when he's met it, then you will never see it. Amen. You know why? It's by works and not by faith. When you can believe the truth, then God can make that truth real in you. But until you can believe it, friend, he can't make it real in you. He may just have mercy on some of us, bless us in spite of us while he's working at growing us, but 
Uh, that's not the that's not his normal life for you and me. Amen. Won't you turn to First John? First John. Uh, Four. This is some verse. I sometimes think we like to read it like this. Ye are of God, little children, and if you try your best, ye shall overcome. Is that what it says? Listen to it. Ye are of God, little children, if you pray four hours a day, ye shall overcome. Is that what it says? Ye are of God, little children. If you read your Bible, every day ye shall overcome. Does it say that? What does it say? It says, ye are of God, little children, and does it say will or have? Have overcome. Sister, you know you was talking about being discouraged on Monday? Did you know what? You know why? You believe a lie. You know what? The devil makes you feel like you're discouraged, and you believe it, and you are. Amen. You see, you're really an overcomer. Don't get upset, because we all have that problem. Amen. Amen. But I want you to know something, folks. The truth is, the truth is, the Bible says if you're saved, you are an overcomer. You say, well, Brother Manley, then if I'm an overcomer, why do I do some things? Because you don't believe that you're an overcomer. Look at the, that have there. It says you have overcome. You have overcome. Amen. You have already. You said, but Brother Manly, you don't know me. Oh, no, friends. The problem is you don't know yourself. You say, I don't know you personally, but I just know what God says about you, and I know what God says about you is true. You say, well, then if I'm an overcomer, why is it that I'm confused, I'm perplexed, I'm depressed, I'm downcast, and I'm defeated, and I'm overcome by Satan, then if I'm an overcomer? Because, friend, we have not discovered what we are in Christ. And we haven't believed the truth. See, this is a fact about you. This is a fact about me. I'm going to give you some verses for your Bible study in closing this message. Just give you some verses. Genesis 37 Genesis 37, let me give you the verses, 29 through 36. And just read those sometimes when you have a chance. I'm going to tell you the story about it in close. Genesis 45, 25 through 28. This portion of Scripture gives one of the most fantastic illustrations you could ever read. It will bless your heart. And I close this meeting with this illustration. This is something else. It's about Jacob and Joseph, and the family. Joseph was a young lad that came up and kept having a great dream. You know the story? You're familiar with Joseph. And uh, Joseph even told his dad what was going to happen to him. Remember that? It's obvious that his dad didn't pay close attention to him. One day, Jacob sent Joseph out on the ranch to meet up with his brothers that hated him, despised him. The brothers of Joseph took Joseph, stripped him of his beautiful, beautiful cloak, threw him in a ditch, and later sold him into slavery. 
in order to have something to tell Jacob, Joseph's dad, they took a goat, killed that goat, dipped that beautiful cloak in the blood, and assimilated a situation where it looked like a wild beast had attacked Joseph and killed him. So when they got home, there was this cloak, all bloody. And the story was indicated. And Jacob's spirit began to mourn. That's what the book says. You read the story and it's all there. He mourned in his spirit. He put on sackcloth and ashes and mourned many, many days. If you read on through the story, in Genesis 45, the famine is on. The sons of Jacob go to Egypt for help. They run into Joseph. Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. And you know all that beautiful story. And Joseph sent for his dad. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. And it's all in the scriptures I gave you. The sons of Jacob beat the wagons home. And they ran up to Jacob and said, Joseph is yet alive. And he said, I don't believe you. He said, I do not believe you. They said, yes, he's yet alive. And about that time, he saw the wagons coming. And they said, he sent for you. When jo and they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. You know how many years had been mourning? Twenty years. You know why his spirit was in mourning? For the death of a boy by the name of Joseph. Now, are you still with me? Now, watch it. Jacob was mourning over the death of Joseph. Why, friends, that's not the truth. That was a lie. Jacob heard a lie and believed it. And when he believed a lie, he mourned. When he heard the truth, 20 years later, and believed it, he was revived. You and I have got to realize that Satan will take the truth and turn it into a what? A lie. You and I have got to learn how to discover the truth and believe the truth, for the truth shall set us free. Amen? All the devil will tell you a lie, get you to believe it. You're an overcomer tonight. You're not only an overcomer, but loved. God has supplied all in it. That's facts. There's others that have promises about sons and daughters. Boy, do not let the devil get you to believe a lie. You believe God. Would you bow your heads with me, please?